Hi friends! Welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the first half of February. So far I would say I've had a really great reading month. I've been getting through a lot of books, I've read a lot of very good books, and I have a lot to share with you. So if you're new to my mid-month wrap-ups, the way that these work is I'm going to talk about all the books that I read in the first half of the month in chronological order. At the end of the month you'll get all my reading stats and we'll talk from lowest rated to highest rated, but for the purposes of today's video I'm just going to talk about them in the order that I read them. That said, before we jump in, a couple of caveats. First I have read two HarperCollins titles that I won't be able to give you in-depth reviews for. I am really hoping this is the last time I'll have to say this. The HarperCollins union has been on strike since November. However, they have finally reached a tentative agreement. So if that agreement is ratified by their members, that would mean the end of the strike. And then I can actually tell you about all the HarperCollins books that I've not been reading in support of the union. So fingers crossed that happens soon so that I can number one, put up my video where I'm talking about all of the HarperCollins titles I've been reading since, you know, December, no, end of November. And number two, finally give you my full best books of the year video, which I have also been putting off because of the strike, because several of the books on my best of list are HarperCollins titles. So really hoping this is the last time we have to do this. That said, in February so far, I have read When He Was Wicked by Julia Quinn. This is book six in the Bridgerton series. And the Last Tale of the Flower Bride by Roshni Chokshi. So unfortunately I won't be reviewing either of these today because they are HarperCollins titles. However, stay tuned and hopefully very soon you will get to hear all of my thoughts on them. Next let's talk about my DNFs or books I did not finish. This month so far there have been two of them and both of them are books that I had for review. First up is one that I'm definitely disappointed about and I kept trying to keep reading it and trying to like it, uh, but unfortunately I just don't think this was going to work out for me. That is Wild Blood by Lauren Blackwood. I had previously read her debut YA novel and liked it quite a bit and so I was hopeful about this. The premise sounded potentially interesting, more of an intense YA fantasy novel about young black people with magic who are being kidnapped and forced to work for this like exotic travel company in Jamaica to lead people through this dangerous magical jungle, right? I read 59% of this book before deciding to DNF and I'm going to talk a little bit about why. So for a lot of this book I was kind of struggling because I felt like the book wasn't entirely sure what it wanted to be. On the one hand it was this very dark, very traumatic book about a young woman who has been abused in every way possible and is dealing with that abuse on an ongoing basis, is deeply traumatized by that abuse, and I think maybe this book was wanting to say something about things like colonization and racism and enslavement of people and trauma, and I think could have done that. But then what was weird was at the same time it was layering on this tropey insta-love YA romance plot, and those two things just weren't working together for me very well. I was really struggling with it. Insta love YA romance isn't always my favorite thing anyway, but especially in this case when the rest of the content was so heavy and so dark and our young woman is incredibly traumatized to the point that she freaks out when other people touch her but somehow she's able to let this man just like kiss her. I don't know. It was... Uh, it, it was a little bit discordant to me. Regardless, I was like, okay, I'll just kind of keep pushing through though. And then there was a scene that I finally, I, I just, I, I unfortunately, given my own history, was like, I can't, <laughs> I can't continue with this. So one part of the plot is that the guy that there's this sort of insta-love relationship with is the client for this very dangerous trip that she is leading out into the jungle, right? I'm not going to get into all the details of the plot because it's kind of complicated, but he's this young, fairly wealthy black man who she has this kind of insta-love type 
connection with. And he is looking to exploit the wealth of the jungle that doesn't belong to him, but he is also a Christian. And there was a scene after she had dealt with something traumatic where he was talking to her about God and sort of being the voice of God to her, telling her what he thought he heard God saying to her to comfort her in that. And I was just really deeply uncomfortable with that dynamic. As somebody who has a history of religious trauma and also is used to <sighs> stories that kind of heap abuse on a character as a way to prove that God can save them and redeem them through it, not through therapy, just because God, um, and like if people find comfort in God, that's fine. But I was very, very uncomfortable with the idea of there being this insta-love romance between her and this man who has a lot of power in relation to her, a lot of power in relation to her, who is then also becoming sort of the voice of, of God to her. Anyway, I, I just, I couldn't. And so after that scene, I decided to go ahead and DNF it. And I wanted to give other people a heads up for this book because it's not, it's not like it's coming out through a Christian imprint. It's coming out through a generic YA fantasy imprint. And it's certainly not marketing itself as being particularly religious. And I know that there are other people who follow me who might also be bothered by that content. And so I wanted to give you all a heads up. I was hoping to really love this, but unfortunately at that point it was too much for me. And so I DNF'd it. The other book that I DNF'd is The Foxglove King by Hannah Witten. I know some of you guys are probably going to be disappointed at this. I read 32% of this book before deciding to DNF it. And I will say that this was my second time trying Hannah Witten. I read her debut novel and had a mixed experience with it. There were things that I liked about it and other things that I didn't so much love, but I thought, okay, this is a new book in a new world. Let me give it a try and see. And I had a lot of the same problems, only more so. So I just, I just don't think Hannah Witten is going to be the author for me. So The Foxglove King is kind of a fantasy romance or a romantic fantasy, I guess you could say. But the thing is, I got 32% of the way in and I felt like it was just so surface level in terms of the world building, the characterization, the setup of this love triangle. I was kind of bored and just not very invested. And as descriptive as this book is, and as long as this book is, I, you know, if I'm handing like 125 pages into the book and you still haven't made me care about any of your characters, and I'm seeing plot holes, and I feel like the world building and characterization is really thin, and I don't like the love interests, um, in a book that in theory I should like, court politics, religious stuff, fantasy romance, like that sounds like it would be up my alley, but I just did not really care about it. On top of which there was some ableist stuff in this. There is a character with facial scarring who is being set up to be kind of an evil character. And there's a line that specifically calls out the idea that he's less attractive because of that facial scarring and tell me why we're doing that in 2023. So yeah, all of that together, I, I, I just was really not that interested and I decided to cut my losses. So I think after this, I've kind of decided Hannah Witten is probably just not the author for me, but uh, you know, your mileage may vary. So moving on, let's talk about all of the books that I did read. In the first half of February, I completed a total of 17 books. Two of those are the HarperCollins titles that I won't be talking about. So that leaves me with 15 books to talk about. And that's great, to be honest. I have been getting through quite a bit and also enjoying most of what I've been reading. The first book that I finished in February was The Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. And this was the last of the books that I read for that big secret project that I've been talking about and finally have been able to share. If you somehow missed it, myself and 16 other booktubers did a giant collab 
collab project that was super fun. We've been planning this since December and all of us were just like so excited to finally share it with you. We each took a category of the Goodreads Choice Awards and read the last 10 years of winners in our category and released a video talking about them. So if you somehow missed them, I will link my video up above and be sure to go check out the entire playlist. We had a fantastic lineup of creators and I've now gone and watched all their videos and they were all great. So highly recommend. Um, but the 2022 winner for the sci-fi category was Sea of Tranquility and I was really excited about this because I had been kind of interested in reading Emily St. John Mandel for a while and had never gotten around to her. She writes more literary science fiction which I can sometimes really enjoy and in fact that was definitely the case here. I freaking loved this book. And now I need to go back and read her other books. I do know because I know people are going to say this in the comments. I am aware that it is in the same universe as The Glass Hotel and Station Eleven and that there's some interconnecting characters. So I do plan to go back and read those books. But I loved this. The writing was so lush and beautiful. I am usually a hard sell on a time travel type book. But the way that this book did it, totally worked for me. It was used in a more metaphorical sense without being quite so concerned about the mechanics of the time travel and it was really more of a deep character study following different characters from different timelines and weaving them together. Oh, it was so good. It was so beautiful. Uh, this was easily a six star read for me which is what I give to a favorite of the year in my personal rating scale. So yeah six stars to Sea of Tranquility. This was easily the highlight of that project for me. I had some definite fails but I love this and I'm very excited to get to go and read more of her work because I love the way she writes and I suspect that her other books will also definitely work for me as well. I will say, like I said, this is more literary science fiction. So I know this isn't going to be everybody's cup of tea. It's very slow paced. It's philosophical. It's taking its time. It's got like lovely lush prose. Um, it was very much my thing, but it may not be everybody else's thing. It's also casually queer. And as I have been informed, thank you to my followers and patrons, because I think I said in that video about the Goodreads Choice Awards that Victoria Schwab was the only only openly queer person. I was not correct. Emily St. John Mandel is also apparently openly queer. There's an article where she talked about having a girlfriend after having gotten a divorce. And I, you know, I've got to say, because I went looking and I couldn't find anything on it, which is why I didn't want to assume. But I'm not surprised having read this book and the way that she handles the queerness in it. It doesn't shock me that she is also queer. Um, so yeah, but I loved this. It was great. Six stars. Next, I read From a Certain Point of View, a Star Wars anthology by a whole bunch of different authors. This is 40 different short stories. And I really enjoyed this. This is on my Star Wars Challenge TBR for the year. I have a few several other books as well that I'm going to be reading, but I thought this would be a good place to start. I listened to the audiobook for this and that was definitely a good choice. It is really a fun audiobook. It's got like sound effects and stuff and it's narrated by a full cast. And I just think the project of this is really cool. I don't know why I didn't realize what it was, but this is basically step by step going through the entire plot of the first Star Wars movie, but through surprising perspectives, side characters, creatures, people in the background instead of the main characters. And so you're getting bit by bit, you know, each story by a different author, the plot of that film, but from a different point of view. And I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, of course, in an anthology like this, some stories are better than others, but some of them are really fantastic and taken as a whole. I think it's a very cool project. I ended up giving this four stars and I would definitely recommend it. If you are a Star Wars fan, I think this is cool. And I liked it as an introduction to some of the authors who write full novels in the Star Wars universe. Then I read another book on one of my challenge TBRs for the year. I've been like getting through them pretty well. I had a few that I've, I've, I've got a few I've been reading, but I picked up Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro and I enjoyed it. I will say I had kind of a sense of what the, the twist 
in this book was gonna be. I, I, I feel like it's been out so long and there's been a movie made that it's hard to not have kind of picked up on what the twist was probably gonna be. I don't I don't know that even when it came out it was that surprising. Maybe it was. I don't know. Um, but I also feel like this book is just not so much about the twist. This one was not quite what I was expecting. It's talked about as kind of like a gothic sci-fi thriller type thing. And yeah, yes, but not at all written or paced like one. And so I think you need to know going into this, this is a very slow paced character study that takes its time laying the foundation for what it's eventually trying to do. And I'll be honest, the first like third to half of this book, I was like, this is fine, but I don't, I'm not that invested in it as it was kind of telling us about the main character and her life in this English school and the things that happened to her being raised there as a kid. And I was like, this is like kind of interesting, but I'm a little bit bored. But I will say that layer upon layer, he kind of lays the foundation so that by the end of the book, I was so invested <laughs> in what was going on and so invested in the character arcs that he takes us through. I feel like it is just masterfully done. Now you definitely have to be patient with it because it's not something that will grab your attention and pull you all the way through the book. That's just not the sort of book it is. It is a quieter, slower paced, deeply character driven kind of speculative novel with like some speculative elements to it. But wow, it was great. I ended up giving this four stars. Not a new favorite and not my favorite of books that I've read from Kazuo Ishiguro, but I am glad that I finally went ahead and read it. And it, uh, it took a turn towards the end where I was like, okay, I see. I get this. I have not yet seen the film, so at some point I may do that. I hear that it's a fantastic adaptation. But yeah, I finally read Never Let Me Go. Yay. It's been languishing on my TBR for years. After that, I read Real by Kennedy Ryan. I'm not going to say too much about this here because we do have a podcast episode all about this. So if you're interested in checking that out, I will link it up above. Myself and Izzy from Happy For Now did an episode on it for Chapter 3 podcast. We both really love Kennedy Ryan, but also she likes to break our hearts and make us cry. So we can't read her all the time. But this had been on our TBRs for a while and it seemed like a great time to read it. Real is is a hard-hitting contemporary romance that is following an up-and-coming director who focuses especially on biopics and documentary film and an up-and-coming actress who he casts as the lead role in a biopic film that he's directing focusing on the life of an early black jazz singer in Harlem who was a queer woman. And so this book is periodically interspersed with scenes from the film that is being made, which I think is really cool. It gives us this sense of history. And while the specific person mentioned in the book is not a real character, we see in the author's note at the end that Kennedy Ryan kind of cobbled her together through reading about the lives and histories and experiences of multiple black women who were jazz singers at the time. And so it is drawing on real history. Now, if you've been following me for any length of time, you know that usually I am a little bit of a stickler for power dynamics in a relationship. And so I was like, listen, I, I love Kennedy Ryan. I trust Kennedy Ryan, but I'm a little bit nervous about going into something where it's a romance between a director and his actress. But I think she did a pretty good job with handling the power dynamics. It's not perfect, but I think it's about as good as it can be. And it is pretty clear that they've always been into each other. There is consent. And I ended up loving their relationship. It was so beautiful. It made me emotional by the end. One thing that you should know about this, this is a big content warning, is that it is a book that deals with chronic illness and it is not light. It's 
well done, I think, and really good, but the heroine is dealing with a lupus diagnosis, and that is a big part of this book as well. But I loved this. I loved their relationship, and I think it is well worth a read. If you haven't tried Kennedy Ryan, she's fabulous. I gave this book four and a half stars. Then I read That Time I Got Drunk and Saved a Demon by Kimberly Lemming. This was really fun. This is the book club pick for my Patreon book club for February. People got to vote on a a speculative or romance book by a black indie author in honor of Black History Month and this was the book that won and I'm so glad it did because it was a blast. I think that book club is going to be a lot of fun and it's going to be really interesting to see how people did with this. It's a fantasy almost like monster type romance that's got a very tongue-in-cheek type of humor to it and a quite a bit of plot. It does get steamy and spicy at times but it focuses quite a bit on this adventure plot as well and it's very funny. It made me laugh out loud and I for sure want to read more from Kimberly Lemming in the future. It follows a woman who accidentally frees this demon who then asks her to go on this quest with him to stop an evil witch sort of. That's like the best <laughs> the best way to tell you. But the demons aren't like demon demons. You, you gotta read the book to see. But she's hilarious. She's this like quirky plus size girl who has like a snack pocket in her skirts. I just like I got such a kick out of this. The humor of this really worked for me. It's kind of wacky at times and I thought that the quest elements pulled it along really nicely. It was fun. Uh, one thing that is worth noting and this is in the content warnings at the beginning of the book, is that there are moments of dubious consent and it has some light BDSM elements. The, the sexy time piece of it honestly is not totally my cup of tea, but I just found the whole rest of the book to be so delightful that I wasn't super bothered by it. And if that's up your alley, all the better for enjoying this. I ended up giving this four stars and then I went and bought the other two books in the series. So... I enjoyed it. It was fun. Next I read Promise Boys by Nick Brooke. This I had as an advanced copy from NetGalley and I liked it. This is a YA kind of mystery thriller set at a all boys prep school for underrepresented students. It's honestly kind of an abusive school and most of the boys that go there are black indigenous or people of color. The plot follows three teen boys who are suspects after their principal is murdered. But all of them individually say they didn't do it and they want to uncover the truth of what really happened. So it's a murder mystery that is dealing with a lot of social issues and I think it's really good. It's a debut novel. It's very fun and fast-paced. It's easy to get through. It's accessible. I think the mystery part of it is interesting and done really well. I liked this one. I know it's getting pushed out quite a bit by the publisher and I think with good reason. I feel like a lot of people would enjoy this. I gave it four and a half stars. Then for the third and last so far book that I've read for one of my yearly TBRs, I picked up The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. This is on my nonfiction TBR for the year and this seemed like a good month to pick this one up. I liked this a lot. I can see why this is now considered something of a foundational text for the topics that it's considering. I can see a lot of through lines from this to other more recent books that I've read. I think a, a clear example is Cast, by Isabel Wilkerson, for instance, obviously drew a lot of ideas from this book and then expanded them and fleshed them out. There are others as well that were clearly influenced by this. It's really, really well done nonfiction. Some of this is material that I've seen covered in other books as somebody who's read pretty widely in, in topics to do with race in the United States, but there was also a lot of detail she goes into that was new information for me that I appreciate talking about the specifics of the criminal justice system in the United States. It's in impact on black men, uh, the history of the war on drugs and what happened with that. I think this is absolutely worth reading and it's particularly interesting because I read the 10th anniversary edition and so seeing her write this new introduction to the book and at the time she was writing it was during the Trump presidency, she talks about how the climate of the world had changed so much from when she initially wrote this in the early Obama years where nobody really wanted to hear what she was saying and was like, we're like 
clearly post-race mattering. And uh, she was like, well, now, you know, it's easier to see what I'm talking about, but also there are things that have changed a lot. So I thought that was really interesting. I think this is worth a read. I gave it four stars and I would recommend it. Then I picked up what is the worst book I've read this month. And unsurprisingly, that is Hidden Pictures by Jason Rekulak. I am not going to go into any detail on this because I have a standalone video laying out all of my problems with this book, but this was a one star read for me. And it was honestly even worse than I was expecting. I decided to read it so that I could officially have an opinion and review it for people, even though I knew I was pretty sure it was going to end up being transphobic. It was in fact transphobic, but it had a lot of other isms as well. <laughs> it was rife with conservative dog whistles. It, it, y'all, it was, it was a lot. So if you haven't yet seen that video, I will link it up above. You can go check that out. I'm not going to get into it here, but uh, this was a one star read for me. Then I read The Cage of Dark Hours by Marina Lostetter. This is the sequel to The Helm of Midnight, which was something that I was surprised how much I enjoyed at the end of 2022 and was excited to pick this up. I liked this one, but I didn't love it as much as I did the first. While I feel like The Helm of Midnight can kind of be read as a complete story arc on its own. I don't feel like that is true of Cage of Dark Hours. This does have a bit of middle book syndrome and it's obvious that it is part of a trilogy. That said, I am continuing to like the world. I think the world is really unique and interesting and the magic system. There is a lot of secrets being uncovered. Heads up though, this one does get a little intense, especially if you're a parent, because there is a cult that abducts children as infants and raises them in abusive ways ways for reasons and uh, it's that can be difficult to read at times but I liked this and I do want to read book three. I ended up giving this book four stars. Thank you to Tor for sending me a copy. Then because I needed something a little bit lighter after <laughs> Hidden Pictures and The Cage of Dark Hours, <laughs> I uh, listened to The Duke's Secret Cinderella by Eva Devon and this was delightful. I I think a lot of people are sleeping on Eva Devon to be honest. She is a fantastic historical romance author. She writes fun, lighthearted historical romance that's a little bit steamy, but not super steamy. Like she'll have two or three sex scenes in her books, but it's heavier on plot. She has strong, smart, independent female characters who have a lot of agency. She's got heroes who are not super alpha male. I am just a big fan of the books that I have read from her, at least from her last several releases. And this is no different. This is a loose retelling of Cinderella in Regency England, except instead of an evil stepmother, we have an evil stepfather and her stepsister is more like her BFF. So I just enjoyed the hell hell out of this. I loved the romance. I loved the dynamic. I think some people who are really sensitive to lying in relationships aren't getting on with this as well. She ends up weaving kind of a web of deception. I wasn't bothered by it because I think she had good reasons for it and I understand why she did that. So it worked really well for me. But if that is something that you really hate in romance, this may not be for you. I just I, I had such a good time with this. It was fun. It was light. It was everything I wanted it to be. I gave it five stars. Then I read The Wild Robot Escapes by Peter Brown. This is book two, um, sequel to The Wild Robot. This is one that I read to my kids before bed. And I loved it. It was just as charming as the first book and, uh, you know, brought some new things to it. I would really recommend it if you want some good cozy sci-fi to read to your kids. I think this series is fantastic. And I just love Roz the robot and her adopted gosling son Bright Bill. Their relationship is so cute. This was great. It was, it was wonderful. Five stars. Now my kids want me to go out and buy the third book that just came out in January so we can also read that. <laughs> then I read The Severed Thread by Leslie Vetter. This is the sequel to The Bone Spindle, which I loved the year that it came out. It's like Indiana Jones meets a gender bent retelling of Sleeping Beauty with queer characters and like an amazing central female friendship. The, f the first book was a rollicking good time and I adored it. The second book was nearly as good. 
really, really enjoyed it. I didn't love this one quite as much as the first one. It, you know, it's the middle book in the series, but I think it's a pretty damn good middle book in the series, to be honest. And I just continue to adore our central female friendship. Also, I'm very invested in this side sapphic relationship that is like a will they, won't they, or is she gonna go do evil things? I don't know, we'll see. It's just, it's really good. It's a good time if you are a lover of fantasy and kind of adventure stories and want casually queer representation, I would recommend. I gave this four stars. Then I read Coming Home by Kennedy Ryan. This is an Audible original romance novella that was really cute. I enjoyed this. Now, Kennedy Ryan usually doesn't write anything light. Everything she writes is like, will like tear your heart out of your chest this, this is not that. So in a rarity, we're getting a lighter side of Kennedy Ryan, and I quite enjoyed it. Also, if you are looking for a romance with an older couple, this features people in their 40s. So a little bit different from our like 20 somethings that we typically get in romance. It follows two 40 something black people who are very successful journalists in their field who sort of had an attraction will they won't they thing in college but nothing ever happened with it and now their HBCU is having a homecoming where the guy's daughter is going to be homecoming queen and they are asked to do an on-screen interview at the event so they're going to be reconnecting and maybe sparks will now fly later in life. I really enjoyed it. It was very cute. It gave me exactly what I wanted when I read it, and I gave it four stars. All right, we're doing good. Two books left to talk about. First, I listened to Kiss Her Once For Me by Alison Cochran, and oh my god, this was so delightful. I know the holidays are over, but I don't care. I am enjoying my holiday romance era. Um, this was great. It's a sapphic holiday rom-com, and it, it's another one where if you're super sensitive to deception, maybe steer clear, but I loved this. I laughed out loud. I was here for the romance. It was so fun. I desperately want this one to get turned into a movie. Like Netflix needs to adapt this. I would love to see this on their next roster of holiday films because it would be amazing. Also, if you are somebody on the ace spectrum and you're looking for demisexual rep, got demisexual rep. It's got some good mental health rep in it. I, I was a fan. It was great. So here's the basic premise of it. A year ago, Ellie, who is demisexual and usually takes a long time to form an emotional bond before she can experience sexual attraction to somebody, unexpectedly fell in love on Christmas when she spent the entire day with a woman that she met at a bookstore a woman who is a lesbian who wants to open a bakery called The Butch Oven. I mean, if that's not delightful. She fell in love. They slept together. But the next morning, she discovered that it was only a one night stand and her heart was broken. And now a year later, her entire life is falling apart. She lost the job that she had moved to the city for. She's working as a barista. She's about to get kicked out of her apartment because the rent is going up. When coming to the rescue is the man who is the landlord of the coffee shop where she works, who makes her an offer she can't refuse. He has discovered that his grandfather requires him to get married before he can access his trust fund, but he doesn't really want to get married. So he asks her to do a marriage of convenience with him in exchange for a percentage of that inheritance money once everything is worked out. And he wants her to come meet his family for the holidays and pretend that she's been his girlfriend for a few months before they got engaged, right? She says yes, of course, and goes to his house for Christmas only to discover that who is his sister? The girl she fell in love with who broke her heart. It's excellent. Like the drama is so good. And what I think makes this even better is that the sister has a non-binary best friend and the brother is secretly in love with them. So there's like a whole love quadrangle thing going on here. It is over the top and dramatic and funny as hell. And I loved it. Again, there's a web of lies here that ends up being a problem, but we get some grand gesturing at the end and ah, it was great. I loved it. Four and a half stars. Highly recommend. 
And lastly, the final book that I read in the first half of February is Blue Revolution by S.E. Martins. This is a debut YA fantasy novel that is self-published, and the author kindly sent me a copy for review. I think that this is a really promising debut novel. There is a lot to like about it. One of the biggest things that I want to say about this, because listen, I've read a good amount of, <laughs> I've read a good amount of self-published things at this point. And one thing that I've noticed, particularly in science fiction and fantasy, is often, not always, often there can be a tendency in those genres for self-pubbed authors to write prose that is like ugh, overly long sentences, overly high level vocabulary that's like too try hard and like kind of convoluted prose that makes it difficult to read and a chore to get through. That is not at all the case in Blue Revolution. One of the things that I appreciate maybe the most about this book is that it is very readable. I mean, the prose is good. It's descriptive. It gives you what you need for the story, but it's not convoluted. The sentences are like normally structured and simple, and it's easy to breeze through the book, which was honestly a very pleasant surprise as somebody who has had indie and self-pubbed books sent to me that I struggled with because of the sentence structure. So just on a prose level, I think this is very good. The copy is really clean. I did not at all have a hard time reading it. I kind of flew through it when I was reading it. I put it down because I had other projects to do, but like anytime I picked it up, I was getting through it very quickly. I'm also super intrigued by the world. We get hints dropped at some interesting things that I have questions about that I'm guessing are going to be explored more in future books, but the lore and the kind of hidden history of the world that we're in is really interesting. The basic setup of this is we follow a character named Setsi who in our world is this kind of normal high school teen girl who's being bullied a lot and has recently lost her dad. But as it turns out, she is also the reincarnated spirit of Setsephone, a princess who died leading a rebellion in another world and then she's able to cross over into that world and is being chased by a death goddess who wants to kill her. So, <laughs> um, so there's a lot going on. Most of this book is set in this alternate world, not in our world, and there's a lot of interesting things happening. In terms of pacing, the first almost half of this book is very fast paced, very action heavy, almost I would say breakneck speed and a bit too much. It got to the point where I was like, okay, we need like room for these characters to breathe in between all of the action and the fighting and like losing people during fight scenes and stuff like that. But then the second half of the book was excellently paced. It started to give us a really good blend of these action scenes where a lot was happening and quieter moments between characters where they had time to breathe, to rest, where we got to know the characters. And so um, I really appreciated that. There were other things too where I was like, oh, this is a criticism I'm gonna have. And then at some point in the book, I was like, okay, it's kind of fixing that. So like the pacing was one of them where, you know, partway through the book, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like, we need time for the characters to breathe. And then we started getting it, which was great. Um, the main character, I would say at the beginning of the book, gives off some of the sort of like, not like other girls vibes that I was like, oh, okay, this isn't my favorite. But I think a lot of that gets fixed by later on in the book. She does start to develop relationships with other people, including women on her team. And like that kind of gets better, I think. There are characters I really like. We've got a side character who's like this badass kind of warrior woman. There is, of course, a love interest and some casual queerness. And the the guy, Kazuo, like everybody's in love with him. I don't really get it. I think if I was a teen girl, it would have that the, the love interest piece would maybe work better for me. Personally, I was like, mm, dude is not my cup of tea. <laughs> like, I don't know why everybody's fallen in love with him, but OK, whatever, you know. Uh, but I really like this. There's a lot that happens. I am intrigued. I kind of want to know what's going to happen next. So if you are looking for a good indie author to support, you want to go support a queer Canadian indie author, go check out Blue Revolution and uh, stay tuned because there's another book in the series coming. I don't know when exactly, but yeah, it is violent. So like there's a good deal of violence in this, but 
I liked it. I gave it four stars. Those are all of the books that I read in the first half of February. Overall, I think it was a really strong start to the month. I read a lot of things that I liked. I mean, Hidden Pictures was for sure a low point, but I've been enjoying the majority of the things I've been picking up, which is fantastic. I've been getting through things pretty quickly. I feel like it's been a very strong month and I'm excited to see what else I get to in the rest of the month. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, tell me what is a pet peeve you have in plots, particularly romance. I mean, if you want to tell me about something else, that's fine. But like, I see people reviewing a couple of the books that I loved on this list and being annoyed at the fact that a character had deception to the significant other, even if there were reasons for it. I wasn't particularly bothered by it, but some people have that as kind of a pet peeve. So what is something in romances that really bugs you? Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.